Today we are excited to have Dr. George Dengis presenting on bioprosthetic heart valve thrombosis. Dr. Dengis is a professor of medicine at the Icon School of Medicine and the director of cardiovascular innovation at the Zena and Michael A. Winger Cardiovascular Institute at the Mount Sinai Medical Center. He obtained his medical degree at the University of Athens in Greece, after which he completed his residency in internal medicine at Brown University. He subsequently completed his cardiovascular disease and interventional cardiology fellowships at Mount Sinai Hospital. He served as associate professor and program director of inter interventional cardiology at Columbia University before joining the faculty at Mount Sinai in 2010. Dr. Dengis is a leading authority in the performance of non-surgical cardiac and vascular interventions using both established and novel techniques and in preventing and, and dissolving thrombosis in the coronary and peripheral arteries. He is currently serving as chair of the American College of Cardiology Interventional Scientific Council and has been a trustee of the Society for Cardiovascular and Geography Interventions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dengis. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to uh, present this very interesting topic uh, to you that has been uh, changing uh, over, the past, uh, over the past few years, in fact, and with uh, some contributions also from our group at Mount Sinai. The, uh, the thing that you probably have noticed in the clinics, in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the hospital, and in the conferences is that all the subsequent valve disease are, are uh, discussed at the sort of a heart team that is has been ever expanding uh, all the time and includes not strictly the people who prefer the procedures or the surgeons that's how it started but then went on to the chf team includes the primary attendings non-invasive cardiology sometimes we need vascular surgery cardiac anesthesia radiology is very involved essentially the panel medicine and the hospital are really involved in in all aspects and more and more uh, these procedures become more popular, more and more showing up in greater numbers in uh, the primary care doctors once again, not only in the beginning, but also at the very end. And this becomes a common place to see patients with aortic aortic valves pre 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 uh, placed either by the percutaneous uh, transcatheter mode or in, uh, you know, obviously the classic surgery as well. In general, this procedure, the percutaneous uh, in, uh, uh, TAVR, as we call it, transcatheter or valve replacement, has become popular over time. And although this is not the focus of this talk, I want to present just two slides about the latest trials. That in general, the blue line, which is the TAVR, fares pretty well with surgery, which is the yellow line, out to two years. This is one of the popular uh, uh, types of valves and the pretty similar data with, uh, with other valves all the way out to three or five years. And if you are able to place the valve by the most minimally invasive approach, which is the transfemoral approach, then the difference becomes significantly in favor of the new minimally invasive method, uh, which is essentially a valve of the same quality, actually identical, since the, the, com the same companies make the bioprosthetic and the uh, uh, surgically and uh, transcatheter valves, but the difference is one has a sewing ring that the surgeon sews on the valve that takes a little space, and, and, the, and the percutaneous valve is just mounted on a stand which is much thinner than the, uh, than the sewing ring, and therefore the effective orifice area for a given patient can be a little bit bigger actually if you do the percutaneous uh, uh, replacement and in the patient population that's selected for the most minimally invasive even without general anesthesia, just with transfemoral approach, you can save a lot of morbidity and other events. Ultimately, you're able to decrease the, uh, uh, the joint in very important point of mortality or any stroke, as you see here. Uh, this doesn't mean that events don't happen, though. And events do happen. If I modify a little bit the scale now, I magnify the events that can happen, in particular focus on cerebrovascular events. Uh, this relatively early population with aortic stenotic aortic valve disease does have, in general, a population risk that's outlined ever going at the bottom, at the lower uh, uh, reddish line, and it, you know, keeps going at the slow rate year after year. These are older patients. It started with the 90s, now we have patients in the 80s, sometimes we have patients even in 100 years. And then, on top of that, you have the green spike, 
which is a peri procedure vulnerable period that is dominated by the implantation itself with its own risks and perhaps atrofibrillation. An interesting study came, came a few years ago, and, I'm, and I still show it because they're very organized, and the first one on the subject, and really subsequent ones, have just verified the findings that in the 30-day early cardiovascular, uh, cerebrovascular events, a new onset AFib, and how much you work around the valve, if you do more dilations, etc., are related with events of, uh, of this type uh, after the, these procedures. When you move to late, uh, cerebrovascular events, then the predictors change completely and move away from these new events around the surgery and they're dominated by chronic atherosclerosis and chronic atrofibrillation. And if you look at the baseline patient characteristics in relation to possible stroke risks, one can easily see that regardless of whether they had AFib or whether you have been able to see AFib, in a random EKG or in telemetry, this population we're talking about and included in all those trials deals with a very high CHAD score. So in general, there is an ongoing significant stroke risk here that affects our population. Is that all? Is it just a baseline characteristics? No. AFib and valvular heart disease are intimately related from a pathophysiologic point of view because of the uh, loading condition of the heart, the dilations of the atria uh, or the atrial walls and all that can predispose to atrial fibrillation. And from then on, AFib can branch out and affect a variety of conditions, um, including cognitive impairment, hospitalizations, heart failure, sudden deaths, go on, to mortality, and obviously, if not mortality, they leave patients rather frail. Another interesting point that has been maybe overlooked, although it's been published for several years, is that aortic valve leaflets change in composition as they become stenotic. And you can see that the brown color is more prominent in the right picture and intermediate in the middle picture, and this indicates that the tissue factor is expressed inside the leaflet content of the patient with more stenotic valves. However, our population that requires these types of replacement procedures are really these kinds of patients to the right with a lot of tissue factor inside the valve. So we have a practical problem in, in disrupting or manipulating the stenotic leaflets, we expose the circulation locally to significant uh, tissue factor activities. Um, let me just say up front show some data on the bioprosthetic surgical valves. Again, you can see here how the valve is within a sewing ring, and you can understand that this very, uh, very small ring, however, uh, uh, has like a two, two millimeters or so in diameter, and overall, because uh, it's in, in the outmost area of the radius, it affects quite a bit the effective orifice area of these valves. But in general, the, the reports have been in the literature rather haphazardly in uh, high valve thrombotic, bioprosthetic bio valve thrombosis after surgery, particularly in the very beginning, uh, and as well as the degeneration. And there's always been a lot of difficulty to identify and characterize which one of the two conditions may present, because it's very difficult to see via non-invasive imaging, and even with some of the invasive imaging, it's still difficult to understand. Is it all clot, or is it some panus, as we call it, in combination with clot? Or perhaps, as I believe, some initial clot gets organized and then becomes panus by more uh, fibrosis, uh, less uh, active, uh, active uh, uh, activity. In the transcatheter valve, you can see very clearly that this time there is no sewing ring, and you can see the stent is opposed all the way outside. The valve starts inside the stent, and you can see by the echo a very subtle findings of an area of uh, signify perhaps a clot, and you can see indeed in this patient who had other problems and did not die from this reason. There's an explant that you can see that this is a, uh, there were some thrombi located at the hinges of the valve. So this possibility of thrombus developing in those valves, whether they're surgical or whether they are transcatheter placed, 
uh, has emerged with a technology. And the technology that can best identify that is a time-dependent 3D CT angiography, the so-called 4D, uses time as a fourth dimension. So you have to see the valves opening or closing, and then you can understand that perhaps this one opens, but is restricted a little bit, and this one opens better, although over here you can see there is a clot. And why this wasn't known, for example, for the surgical valves, well, CTA, just the 4D CTA, just a new thing, and obviously also nobody was doing any significant research of this kind for so many years, just implanting the valves and hope for the best. So the more you learn and the more you try to investigate, the more you discover. And that's the situation here, and it's very clear that this, this aspect is worthwhile. What does it mean, though? And this is, again, some more pictures that you can see how, uh, if you go away from the CTA and the beautiful pictures, you see you have to have really huge clots to understand better in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, transtophageal echocardiography. Still possible, however, you can see clearly the resolution, not the best here. And again, once again, there is a diagnostic dilemma about how this uh, uh, the condition is ascertained. In the original paper, uh, there was a trend to associate this with TIAs, zero versus three TIAs. However, the overall result not very strong because the stroke went the other way. Uh, the stroke was in the people who had normal leaflet motion. Why? Because people get stroke for other reasons as well. So there seems to be an initially a little, little bit of a muddled uh, uh, waters on exactly what does it really mean to have this small or maybe moderate clotting around the valve. In the recent ACC, this sort of became a little bit uh, uh, rejuvenated and revisited after imaging of 700, over 750 transcatheter valves and about 140 surgical valves. And again, this is not a serial registry. These are patients who somehow were referred for this type of imaging, so there must be some level of clinical suspicion, although the level of clinical suspicion may vary from side to side. Let's say if we are really active in doing research in this area, we may be more motivated to refer even patients who are rather normal or have very minimal symptom or minimal whatever suspicion for that just because we're going to image a lot of people. So any, anyhow, the, um, the message was that the, in general, whoever was anticoagulated for whatever other reason tended to not have those uh, feeling defects and, 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 uh, and therefore uh, the, uh, the waters there become, continue to become a little bit, a little bit not so clear uh, on exactly how to prevent it because we don't know uh, who, what, is a, what is the difference between, uh, between uh, uh, the indication of anticoagulation up front, and I'm going to come to this uh, a little bit later. But what is very interesting and I think very educational for this type of research is that the dual antiplatelet therapy on the right side versus the single antiplatelet therapy, they looked quite similar. So although one can say, okay, well, if you anticoagulate, you don't get much of an effect, and then someone else is going to ask, why should I anticoagulate the patient? Because anticoagulation may have other bleeding risks. We understand that on a population basis. But on the other hand, someone can say, hey, hold on, why are you giving DAPT? That causes bleeding as well. And clearly, doesn't seem to have any obvious benefit here because it looks like, uh, you know, it's the anticoagulant and not that the antiplatelet that causes the, uh, the effect against this type of abnormality. What are the predictors of reduced leaflet motion? That was a disappointment in my part, except for the anticoagulation, that again doesn't really answer that because that's a rare event. Are we going to anticoagulate everyone? I don't know. And then they came up with some kind of a, a very, uh, a very uh, uh, you know, uh, un underwhelming results, such as older people and low ejection fraction has most or more of that. I think everybody kind of knew that for, to begin with. So nothing really groundbreaking regarding the type of valve or the size of valve or something like that. And again, things got better that if you see it, then you can anticoagulate the patient, and most of those go away. If you don't anticoagulate the patient, and you just keep doing serial CTs on, let's say, antiplatelet therapies, then you don't really affect that. So then we have a little bit of a better handle here that if you do anticoagulate, then you get an effect afterwards in those patients. The valve fiber dynamics, I just showed this slide, there's obviously minimal difference you can detect here, just to show that the gradient is not going to give you a hint. The gradient 
was around 14 versus 10, so to speak. So the leaflet, if one leaflet is affected by these little microclots, the gradient is not gonna is not gonna give up that secret. So uh, you have to have a little bit high level of suspicion, perhaps in older patients with low EF, and um, um, other risks for this uh, for this type of clottings to form. Interestingly, it shows the data this time around with more patients that the TIA story seems to be real. So this type of effect or, or in, the, in the imaging uh, finding, I should say, not effect, has an effect on TIA. So I think we can start understanding that TIA rather than stroke is a true relationship, has a true relationship with this type of uh, low level uh, valve leaflet uh, thrombus. And I think the same things I went there, this was the outcome of that. So in an effect to try to figure out how do we systematically approach this, uh, this, uh, this event, uh, we try to kind of put a, a multi-center group together, try to uh, propose some ideas regarding how to even approach that. First of all, to understand that the prosthetic valve thrombosis is not about hemodynamics. I told you that from the beginning, although uh, the, that the, 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 uh, the increased gradient is not going to give up the secret. However, low cardiac output, low ejection fraction may be a factor for that. Hyperviscosity can be a factor for it. We have hemostatic factors that are obviously implicated here if somehow have a hypercoagulability, as well as we have a surface factor if somehow the valve is damaged or there's a leaflet deterioration or there's a stent issue particularly there. So the interaction of all those in, the, in a specific patient or a specific leaflet could give up uh, uh, to this, uh, this little secret of the situation. Then we have again the old story from the surgical valves. Is it clot or is it panus? And what is this thing that we call panus or they used to call panus? So the possibility is always there. Or is this some kind of form of endocarditis? Someone pure imaging point of view, you could say cannot rule out this, cannot rule out that, and then you give the clinician to make this decision. So we have to always figure out which one of these three, and somewhere at the bottom left, you have to also consider, is this a deterioration of the prosthetic valve just because maybe the preservation wasn't so good? And I could uh, implicate this mechanism perhaps when you see all three leaflets being affected at the same time. And then you have you are, you're afraid of cerebrovascular or systemic embolism not at the bottom, but in reality, you're really dealing mostly with subclinical valve dysfunction and a much smaller population of overt, clinically overt dysfunction. So I think all these possibilities drive us crazy a little bit out in the periphery of this, but in the reality, not a, it doesn't seem to be that so many major clinical events are happening right now. So we have our time, at least, to configure it without threatening the entire field. And what are the strategies to prevent thromboembolic complication during TAVR in general? We can have, in a very systematic approach, systemic strategies, such as the anticoagulation, let's say, or avoiding the hypotension during the procedure, or control the hypertension so you don't have bleeding type of events. The electrolytes optimize the medications. Those are, in general, you know, good strategies to have. And then by an anatomical location, uh, you can see ways to protect the cerebral vessels, and there have been some of those. You can see ways to protect or deflect emboli from, uh, instead of going up in the brain, towards down in the periphery. You can be careful about your catheter manipulations. You have to deal with a fib. You have to deal uh, with a valve itself. And you have to remember that some people also have LV clots. So you can see there's a variety of things all over the heart that can be related with this phenomenon. And you need to kind of, in a systematic way, from a research point of view, try to target them. And that's what we tried to do in the first uh, 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 trial that was a uh, randomized trial uh, in many centers. Uh, in many continents, actually, uh, at attempting to use a direct thrombin inhibitor that doesn't have any fluctuation in its uh, anticoagulant effect versus the, versus the uh, uh, fraction that heparin that is always used with some level of uh, reversal with protamine in the end of the procedure, creating a lot of ups and downs. The drawback for bevalirudin is that this is not reversible. So a lot of... Uh, 
operators and surgeons who are very nervous pre, 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 uh, uh, performing a, a transcatheter or revive replacement on a non-reversible agent and warned the DSMB and the investigators that there would be a great amount of mortality in this study and the babalurudin would not be successful. As it turns out, unless you do the study, you don't know, and we're very happy to show that the procedure was very possible, and if anything, the, the event curves of a babalirudin were lower than the unfractionated heparin by two percentages, nine versus seven percent. This was not statistically significant, and due to the higher cost, babalirudin becomes a, a, a backup solution for patients with heat or with other allergies related to heparin. So it's a little bit of a rare population, but I, I must say that I do get emails uh, all the time from around the world uh, uh, thanking for this type of approach because they have scattered patients that they wouldn't know how to treat them otherwise. And again, this, we established the fact that a non-reversible agent can be used if you use it in a smart way and you know exactly uh, which patients to use it up during aortic valve replacement. And this is a NACE, as you can see again, the two valve is exactly, I think, equivalent. By the MRI, and uh, that's another part of, uh, of, this, uh, of this study, we, uh, we attempted to see if there was a difference in the MRI hits, uh, so to speak, uh, in the brain uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the procedure with a more effective anticoagulation. It turns out that the difference wasn't, wasn't, wasn't much, but uh, between the groups, but overall there was a positive message. If there were patients who had uh, no MRI, uh, no, no findings in the MRI, these patients never get a stroke. So that's, a, that's something else that, that we learned. Although having brain emboli doesn't mean you got a stroke. If somehow you don't get them, these people do very well, they don't get a stroke. Um, we can talk a little bit more about the stroke later on, but uh, I want to stay on the fact that in this study that we did not specifically test any device that present, prevents stroke by a filter or other mechanism. Uh, we did not find uh, many more than overall 60 to 65 percent of emboli in the brain. So about 35 percent of the people a third of, did not get emboli by our core lab. And that's a little different, but studies that go uh, on neurocognitive uh, assessment, and in those studies, somehow the control group always get 85 or 90 percent of a degree of positive for emboli. I think, uh, you know, if someone is, is doing a neurocognitive study, sometimes those are calibrated to a much lower uh, sensitivity, and a lot of those events at our core lab here, in a more, I would say, permissive way, call them as non significant or artifact or something may be picked up routinely over there. So I think you need to uh, remember that when you analyze other studies. What we know for, uh, we know for, uh, uh, for a fact is that in general another, another approach that can improve the neurologic outcome of the procedure, not the anticoagulant as, as we saw before, but maybe the filter. And as many filter are related with this, uh, with this procedure and have been tried in different parts of the world by in the small studies. We tried to put them all together in a meta-analysis and we're able to show that uh, although not specifically with any device in particular, in general, the, uh, uh, the, um, the field is moving forward in a positive way and this neuroprotection, so to speak, during the valve procedure would be able to reduce the emboli. And now the other studies experimenting with this type of protection devices during other forms of open heart surgery in general, because those two are, uh, have risk for emboli. So I think this, uh, this was a proof of principle and now moving forward to uh, other surgical operations. Uh, particularly one, one embolic protection device uh, re received a favorable FDA panel recommendation a few months ago and may be approved in the end of the year. So I thought I'd present the biggest study uh, a little bit more. Uh, and this is a double filter that is implanted via the right radial artery and protects one filter, protects the left carotid, and the other bigger filter protects the innominate artery. So if you go down this pathway, uh, the, only, uh, the only artery of the brain that is not protected is a uh, left cerebral via the left subclavian, or in case a patient has a uh, aberrant subclavian from aortic arch or something like that. But the majority of the patients get protection of uh, major parts of the brain. There was a safety cohort as well as an efficacy cohort that compared in a randomized way compares 
the uh, active arm to the, to the control. So the most important findings was, in my mind, the safety, because in general, trying to put something up in the, that protects from any material that goes to the brain uh, is, uh, is sort of a positive thing. But is it safe to put this filter there, or are we going to mess up the carotids, cause dissections, cause strokes, cause all these things? And the answer was that the device arm had about a 7%, much lower than an anticipated historical performance of 18% based on previous studies. And in the control arm, those events were about 9.9%. So just putting the device up there and you know, manipulating around seemed to be relatively easy and safe in the study. And I think that's a very robust and clear message. In the efficacy, it did not seem to have as much as uh, we would think we get. Because overall, or the investigators think we get, and we were a side of this here as well. Uh, what about a 6% stroke versus a 9% stroke? Well, that's a lower, but not statistically significant. And um, uh, if you go down counting the MRI hits, there was about a 40% reduction in the MRI hits, but it was, again, not statistically significant. So you got a good safety. In the efficacy, you sort of didn't quite get there. And what could there be reasons for that? And I think that's a very important thing. They conducted multivariable analysis very naturally to find out what was a predictor of getting too many MRI hits. Was it the valve? Was there any other factor? And they actually found a surprising result that the only factor that predicted emboli after the procedure was the presence of emboli in the baseline MRI that was conducted before the procedure. So this means that patients who have been having emboli for whatever reason, or maybe patients who have emboli can't clear them, again, for whatever reason, they don't seem to handle very well emboli during the procedure as well. And if they, they went ahead and controlled the so-called the baseline flare volume, as the exact MRI, um, MRI uh, variability uh, factor, when they adjusted for that, they were able to show a 49% reduction with the use of the filters that was significant in, a, obviously, a post hoc secondary analysis. So they seem to find some justification of why there could be um, um, uh, not the most robust benefit up front, but maybe if we control for an important baseline variable and you balance out the two uh, uh, groups, maybe this was, uh, this was better. Just to give you some, some, some views of exactly what does it mean, what are these MRIs, how, how does those MRI look? Uh, I want to uh, just see how uh, things were. You can see the baseline, there's some white stuff around here, and you know, we get a little bit more day two to seven, and a little bit more at 30 days. And even more so, I like this picture, because you can see overall, this is the, uh, the brains, uh, the size, the number, and the location. There was a wide distribution. The, these things get all over, not very clearly related to say, you know what, oh, this guy got all the MRIs, this patient got all the MRIs into the left brain, and no wonder they got a right hemiparesis or something like that. It just wasn't like that. You get a lot of MRIs all over, and probably the, a lot of MRI hits all over, and probably what they mean is that the clearance that, you know, exists, the brain has the capacity to clear those things, somehow that did not work well for whatever reason, and that is reflected uh, later on to either cognitive or, or, um, uh, uh, or uh, a neurologic outcome. Uh, the the sub-study on cerebral lesions and neurocognitive assessment, as presented by a neurocognitive expert, and you can just see some pictures, by the way, of what the, what the, uh, what the, uh, what the particles use, and almost everyone got some particles uh, removed out of their filters, which is, again, makes people think that all those things could have gone to the brain, that that could be a benefit uh, right away there, just on the fact that you successfully had debris in the filter versus having nothing in the filter. But the uh, neurocognitive assessment aims to understand or actually expose that by doing an NI slow scale and neurological exam, that's all the only brain parts you really examine. But there's so much brain around that you really can't examine by the neurological exam. And could you, by a battery of tests, could you assess those? In all the elaborate tests, there apparently hasn't been a lot of clinically significant studies thus far indicating that good things are supposed to improve or avert deterioration in any of these scores. So although we're excited that what part of brain is tested by what score, 
it's not extremely clear that those things can be moved by something. So the fact that uh, by the new cognitive community, uh, it was recognized that the fact that in this study, the new cognitive, the cognition testing had, was, as, was, was correlated with the amount of brain emboli was a significant for them finding. It's been probably the, one of the very few, if not the only study that so clearly showed that if you have a lot of brain emboli in the MRI, your cognition is not so good. So, and I think there will be a separate paper coming up about that. The original paper of this study came out in Jack just in January, so I think maybe later this year there's gonna be a very detailed paper with all this data on neurocognitive and all that. Um, and as an outcome, including this study, we had an updated clinical events meta-analysis, I think preceded the uh, FDA positive panel that indicated that the, uh, the use of neuroprotection during Orivav replacement is able to significantly decrease the composite point of death or stroke, again, leaving outside all this, a little confusing to all the clinicians, I must say, MRI findings that's a little difficult to to uh, interpret very clearly and definitively due to the variability that they have. So let's go ahead to other types of studies and strategies to prevent thromboembolic complication after TAVR. And then we come a little bit more now to anticoagulation. We can talk a little bit about or bring out the possibility of percutaneous left atrial appendage closure, although this strategy may not be as as popular in this age group of the 80s and 90s. Why? Because people are maybe too old. Maybe they, they're not up to have another complicated procedure as well. But the anticoagulation, how we mix it with antiplatelet therapy, is very, very important and very topical and can be, can be studied. As I showed you before, Bill Macar uh, indicated that from safety point of view, you get this leaflet thrombosis, it doesn't matter one antiplatelet, two antiplatelets. There's some Italian groups that started doing a, a research actively randomizing patients to aspirin alone versus aspirin and plavix. And they too showed that the only thing you get is mostly bleeding. No catastrophe happened by not doing the tavern, don't have any, any, any pleasures. So uh, the use of clopidogrel, although it's a little bit of a routine, is a routine based on consensus, it's not a routine based on data. The data indicate that no big difference whether you give or not give the clopidogrel. The Galileo study that is evolving that targets to, um, is, a, is about 100 sites all over the world trying to randomize patients after the TAVI into a, into a, a combination therapy of low dose, not the anticoagulation dose, low dose rivaroxaban, which is an anti-10A inhibitor, in combination with baby aspirin in comparison to DAPT. We have, a, we have over 1,000 patients in the study. We aim to finish the study uh, by the fall of 2017, and we're going to have another year of follow-up. So that is the first study to officially test the long-term anticoagulation after TAVR. And we hope to have a lot of interesting findings, including a 4D CTA substudy of 300 patients with a CT in order to show if this uh, low-dose anticoagulation with a low-dose ivroxaban can make a difference in the leaflet thrombosis imaging or not. And already about 150 patients inside the sub-study. So I think we, we have good hope that we complete both of those by the, by the fall. At the same time, primarily a French group is experimenting with another uh, 10A inhibitor, the Apixaban. However, they have a different philosophy. Whereas our philosophy in combination with a group in, in Rotterdam and in Bern, it was to use a low dose anticoagulation the French group goes with a full dose anticoagulation, apixaban 5 milligrams BID, regardless of whether you have AFib or not. We experimented in the previous study in patients without a need for anticoagulation. That's why we're able to use a low dose. Over here, they say whether you have, whether you have AFib and you need antithrombotic, whether you don't have, instead of using an antiplatelet, I'm still going to anticoagulate you fully with apixaban 5 BID. So they're going fully for efficacy, and obviously they're going to have a little bit of a reservation of how the, the, the protocol will survive uh, the bleeding test. So what about to see? This study has about a couple of hundred patients in it. I think it has a little bit more of running time uh, to reach the 1,500. In the meantime, 
Uh, we just started, had the first patient in uh, uh, last week, uh, uh, the trial that's exclusively in fibrillation. It uses another uh, uh, anticoagulant, the doxaban, that is anticipated due to its, uh, 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 there's a rule for every of these anticoagulant, how do you decrease the dose? A doxaban has a very quick, uh, uh, has very, I would say, permissible uh, clause, so we expect that most of the people actually will be treated with 30 milligrams of adoxaban due to their age or renal function, and we compare that to warfarin in patients uh, uh, after TAVI again. Uh, again, all these trials now, uh, the three trials I just presented, have nothing to do with the procedure. We all starting after the procedure is done, patients sort of getting ready to go home. What do we do next? And again, this uh, follows up uh, the patients for about a, a year or two. Finally, the clopidogrel story is a very complicated one because obviously there is no obvious interested partner to, to study clopidogrel, which is a generic drug. So for this reason, we partnered with the ACC and the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, and uh, uh, we, we filed a, uh, a NIH grant for that to specifically uh, use uh, a test whether clopidogrel does anything except for bleeding in this population. And uh, the interest, uh, the, I, th I think the, the, the simplicity of the, of, the, of the randomization is whether you, you know, you did the TAVI, the patient is ready to go home, you can do whatever you want as far as anticoagulation, but the only thing we want to know is are we going to give clopidogrel or you're not going to give clopidogrel. And this is the, the two groups. And also this solves a problem and maybe saves the study in the review process it is so much fluidity out in the world right now. Am I anticoagulating? Am I not anticoagulating? And somehow, if our protocol interferes with that choice, uh, you know, someone can say, you've got to stop the study, or you want to use high dose, or use low dose, what are you going to use? There's a lot of confusion. Uh, in, in this design, we are, obviously the patient may end up uh, change from stratum 1 to stratum 2, or say you want to anticoagulate them, feel free. I, I wrote Coumadin here, but you can use any, any, uh, any anticoagulant that's permissible in this study. Um, and the patient can flip-flop between the strata, but they have to stay in the randomization arm with or without or with clopidogrel uh, throughout the study. We have the results of, the, of this uh, review process later in the year, so I think that's a, I think a, a big year for a, uh, for, for this type of research. Um, the question is, what do we do in the interim? And I have just a couple of slides indicating that there's something to do right now before the studies are, before the studies are, are uh, uh, finished and finalized. You have to be careful and you have to understand what is the time frame we're talking about. Acutely, zero to three days. Subacutely, three days to three months. A little bit more chronically or very late, beyond a year. And then you restratify the patient carefully regarding the Chadva score early on, how the, the peak aortic gradient, the severity of calcification, how easy was the procedure, what was the ejection fraction, how frail the patient is, um, did you use embolic protection, various other things. And then as you move a little bit away from the procedure, you you know, you simplify perhaps your randomization, your stratification. You don't worry so much about the procedure effects, and you also start to think how you're going to modify the short-term antiplatelet therapy to maybe longer-term single antiplatelet therapy, and the, how you want to move up with the anticoagulation. And you're going to you have to have a low threshold, or at least think about the lift and thrombosis possibility if something doesn't match about a certain patient. Barbrosetic valve thrombosis can be classified in order to start understanding it better. And, uh, and obviously, if it's, a very, uh, if it's definite, you need to fulfill both criteria. And at the same time, you have a high diagnostic accuracy. And the more criteria you drop, you end up with a possible thrombosis with many permissive criteria and very low diagnostic likelihood. However, you know, you can also have a temporal classification, and unless you start moving this way as the studies get reported, uh, or in some other classification as others propose, um, it would be very difficult to make sense about this complex, complicated, complex phenomena and, and factors. Ultimately, a final thought that you really need to always think about thrombosis, or is it really panus, or is it really coexistence between the two? 
are they interchangeable? Could thrombosis lead to panos? But I think this will remain, uh, will remain um, a question always, and the imaging uh, will help us more. Um, a serial imaging uh, during after TAVR is, is recommended with a transthoracic echo at one month and then yearly thereafter. However, if there's some suspicion of a low of a low gradient being developing at the one month, then you, you probably need to do another echo around three to six months. Because that may be, as I said, a little bit of a creeping of the, of the gradient from six to 10 or to 12, that, that may be significant. Or you may catch it to become have a gradient of from three to maybe 23 if you do it again at three months. And that may signify some of those subclinical lifted thrombosis. If you come up with a, with a problem, that uh, you think you have to review it better, and the patient has a normal renal function, you can request a 4D CTA, or if there's some reservation of the kidney function, you can request a, a three-dimensional di three TE. And I think, obviously, any center of excellence has any of those very high. Then, what happens if your patient has it? Very few patients, but very sticky problems. Say, so, you know, my patient has a clot in the valve. Now what? Well, you, most of the patients, Although everybody's scared about the left side of the, of the slide, the severe heart failure, most patients really do, are not going to have severe heart failure, thankfully. But if they do, you have to move very fast with optimal anticoagulation, consider hospitalizing the patient for IV anticoagulation. And if it is, uh, if it is uh, uh, very severe, you have to consider thrombolytics or even a valve replacement, particularly if you suspect, and we had a case like that here, of a valve deterioration rather than thrombosis in the end because all three leaflets were massively fibrosed. Um, thankfully, most patients are going to be in New Heart Association 1 or 2, and they will present a clinical dilemma because dyspnea can come for many, many reasons. Um, so a low level, chronic anticoagulation and uh, repetition uh, of, the, of the imaging studies may provide a clue that if the, if the studies be, get better after anticoagulation, maybe indeed this you were dealing with a little clot forming maybe in one or so of the leaflets and you got things better. So in conclusion, uh, I think we went through a lot of data, a lot of studies, a lot of planning studies. I think we know that, uh, and you have all seen, many patients undergoing TAVR, even EPIC now has so many codes about the TAVR. This shows that a lot of people are using them. And, uh, and they have a lot of these patients can have a lot of thrombotic and bleeding related comorbidities. And the optimal antiplatelet anticoagulation therapy is a complex, it's a complex choice. Right now, the guidelines are not derived based on any randomized trial. And this is quite surprising on how, about how complex this field actually is. Uh, however, the studies are emerging, and we hope that the guidelines will be further informed in the, in the near future. The neuroprotection is undergoing clinical evaluation in the United States and is approved in Europe. And hopefully, we may have a first device approved here uh, in, uh, towards the end of the year, so maybe we're going to have a clinical dilemma of how to fit it in our algorithm and which patient we're going to select for it. But I think clearly one can say that based on what we saw and what uh, we, we keep hearing about that and many, many papers published on this, uh, on, the, on the subjects in general, that is one of very exciting and very moving parts of cardiology and internal medicine. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, an intern on uh, the first cardiovascular surgical team at Sinai when we attracted uh, one of your former colleagues from uh, Minnesota. It was some experience. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> secondly, I was wondering whether you ever sleep considering the number of papers you published. Congratulations. A <laughs> little difficult to sleep. You're right about that. <laughs> may, I have a seri may I have a serious question now that I have the microphone? I came in a few minutes late, apologies. You may have answered this question already. But why do older patients who get the valve get a different valve from middle aged and young patients? And why do they get different kind of anticoagulation? Uh, yes, uh, actually this bridges one, a little bit of question that I sort of left out is that the bioprosthetic heart valves is not the only valves that can be are prosthetic because you also have the metallic prosthetic heart valves. And those are typically placed in younger patients because they have higher durability. 
But now they have a drawback in that if the valve fails and it's mechanical, metallic, you've got to go in and take sizes and take it out. So if the intermediate range of uh, age uh, no longer uh, takes these valves by the surgeons, because if they implant a surgical prosthetic valve and that valve, for whatever reason, wears out after 10 or 15 years, then a, a, a percutaneous valve in valve can be placed very safely inside the previous barbrosetic valve and, and that saves, so to speak, the second operation. However, the very young patients, due to the durability uh, of the metallic valve, they still uh, use that, particularly the combination of the bental procedures and other like that that have an orthopathy and all that. I was wondering if any of the studies involving clopridogrel are either genetic or functional assays of the uh, likely response to cl clopridogrel being monitored. Yeah, this is a this very interesting question, and uh, unfortunately not, because the interest to use any other agent but clopidogrel in this age group is very low due to the bleeding. Um, if somehow this valve, these types of valves move to somewhat younger patients that could tolerate better other therapies, uh, there may be some pharmacodynamic studies some more substantiated. Uh, but uh, um, but at, at this point, we plan to have a, a platelet uh, um, activation, if you want, pharmacodynamic sub-study into the CLOI trial, but that will be the first time this is, this is tested. Uh, in, a, in a large scale. Uh, right now, so to speak, from clinical point of view, most surgeons and doctors are, are happy the patients don't bleed on clopidogrel, so I don't think there's a lot of motivation to study how they can give more drug in order to optimize, uh, but perhaps they should do it from the opposite reason, which is a bleeding, in order to rule out hyperresponsiveness to clopidogrel in relation to bleeding. That, 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 that may also be very useful. One more question. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> the frailty syndrome occurred on two of your slides, and one of the characteristics of the frailty syndrome is a slow gait speed. Do, do you use any of these performance studies in assessing which of your patients will uh, make it through the first three months, for example, without atrial fibrillation, which seems to be correlated with the frailty syndrome? Yes, uh, indeed, endofibrillation correlates with the frailty syndrome. The frailty syndrome has been associated with the worst outcome in general. However, it does, those patients also respond well to the valve replacement. It's just that they have, they have high risk before and high risk after if they compare to the non-frail patient, but they still have a delta that is highly significant for their benefit. And indeed, there's more atrial fibrillation as many other comorbidities before and after frailty, and frailty is used a little bit liberal, even the, the, the combination of the definition of frailty uh, has been debated, and, and the original uh, originally it tends to it tends to indicate a patient that a surgeon rules out for any operation just by looking at them, and and then you try to take that as a given and try to quantify that objectively. Uh, there's been uh, some disagreement of how to best accurately do that, but I would agree more with you that frailty is extremely important and we should not rule out intervention in these patients, but I would also rule out invasive intervention in those patients because they simply won't tolerate them. So there are many cases that we screen and screen in the clinic and I project to the family and the patient that only if we find a transfemoral approach that is feasible, we will offer this because then I would rule out even the alternative access with surgery up in the subclavian or in the chest to implant the valve for such patients not to be tolerable with a very high mortality. So that we do. So for example, if you look at something as simple as gait speed compared to Chad's VASC in predicting outcome of very old frail people after the procedure. It, it does predict it. It does predict it. There seems to be a population that can be tested for frailty and frailty does predict the outcomes in general and the non non-recovery of the frailty also predicts an adverse outcome. A different definitions of frailty have been used in different studies, unfortunately. So it's not exactly the same frailty, but in general, the flavor is that frailty is bad. Let's stop. Thank you, Dr. Daniel.